Indians belonging to other states were subject to, to very high degree of atrocities. Particularly when they appeared for Indian public service examination conducted by the IBM. Now, are we moving into a direction into a highly fragmented, you know, fragmented society? <coughs> Uh, on one hand, we say we are Union of India and we have a constitution and there is no constitutional guarantee if a guy from UP sells vegetables in a small uh, township of Pune. No, I, I have to say we are moving towards a fragmented society, but then you will go somewhere else from there. Huh. See, for example, the government, the assemblies, political parties, passing various resolutions in contravention of the judgments passed by the Supreme Court or relevant High Court, uh, with a view to passionate regional feelings or communal feelings, and which can fetch them votes basically. Against the natural principles of justice or the judgments pronounced by the Supreme Court or High Court. Well, I think at one level it's very large. You don't mind if I sit and talk. Okay. Standing too long, and I think as you get older, you want to sit a little longer. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree that India is getting more fragmented than before. For example, in old days we have caste-based fragmentation, sect-based uh, fragmentation. Increasingly, in the last 50, 60 years, the caste-based fragmentation is taking a different form. Smaller castes are disappearing, large caste corporations are appearing, castes across regions are beginning to combine. So at one level, caste remains, but at another level, internal fragmentation is more or less fast disappearing. Similarly, with Hinduism, for example, if I may use that word, I don't care for it because there is no ism, but let's say the Hindu religious tradition. Sects are, at one level, the old sects are fast disappearing. At another level, you begin to see new forms of religiosity appearing. So for these reasons, I wouldn't say we are getting more fragmented or less fragmented. I'm simply saying the change of fragmentation, the pattern of fragmentation is undergoing changes and therefore the old remedies that we had applied earlier in the relation to caste and sect-based fragmentation would not work. We need to think afresh. That's point number one. Point number two you are making toward the end about inflaming passions and all that. I think again I would want to be a little more careful uh, in how I uh, respond to that. You see at one level Politics is about passions. People do feel strongly when their interests are threatened. And therefore they come out onto the street and they make all kinds of things. Politicians are in the business of winning votes. And therefore if they find that a particular issue is their house again, they'll go for it. And you can't stop it. I was reading the other day that in 1951, no sorry, 53, after the 52 election, Panditji wanted to bring Pandit Nehru wanted to bring in a law banning religious based parties. Meaning any party which either used the religious symbol or appealed to religious idioms. And when he consulted his lawyers, they said, Prime Minister, this will be unconstitutional. And you can't do this, and he dropped it. So people continue to arouse passions, whether to Ratha Yatra or uh, Gautha or whatever. What we have to do is two things. A, make sure that certain kinds of passions, in other words, passions which generate hatred for another and likely to lead to violence, that should stop. And secondly, to counter passions by all kinds of means, such as rational debate and rational discussion. I mean, it's perfectly possible for somebody to come along and say, Muslims are taking over the country. I can imagine, I can imagine somebody saying, or oh, their population is increasing, and you know, they are only famous and all that. You can't stop them from saying that. Or there's a bunch of lies. What you can do is to say, well, look, here are statistics. 
polygamy is far more common among Hindus than among Muslims. And I, mean, I don't want to go into that question, but you can give all those facts which people have given. You can also show that the Muslim population is not increasing at the same rate because polygamy declines as people's economic condition improves. So in middle class Muslim family the same thing doesn't happen. Now, but I am not stupid enough to think that mere facts will transform this fanatic's mind. What I am saying is, you plug it away, plug it away, and A, some sensible people will say, yes, this man is right. The fanatic will have some doubt in his mind. And that is all that you can reason can achieve in politics. Plant it out, chip away at the certainty that the man has and give confidence to the moderate who are wondering whether this man is right or not. And the same sort of thing is happening and I see this happening in a big way in India. For 60 years, we lived in the shadow of Pakistan. Pakistan is our enemy number one. And we always stationed our forces, our foreign policy, we were cornered. Just as they are beginning to get out of it, they are boxed into another corner. China is going to attack us. So China is building up. Maybe it will be up just like a contract. 18 billion. So every time our economic prosperity increases, if we have money in the balance, the Americans know how to help us out. We have the for the Germans. You create, now this is not done by putting pressure. This is done by influencing the way in which you think. So what you do is to tell Indians, large middle class, on the move, see how, how the argument proceeds. On the move, your superpower status is secure. Sadly, there's a danger the Chinese watch out. And B, sometimes there are sensible people, some very sensible people, but we sometimes fall, fall for this and play, become playthings of politically immensely sophisticated powers who know how to manipulate you without appearing to do so. To influence someone's way of thinking. And that's where I think my worry about this country, I'm not discussing it here, but on 17th September I'm giving Vikram Sarabhai Memorial Lecture in Andhava, and my theme is precisely this, the future of Indian democracy. And I'm not interested in corruption. Bigger issue than corruption is the quality of deliberation. Imagine tomorrow all corruption disappears in India. Chaprasi doesn't want money, the ticket collector doesn't want money, and so.